Welcome to the Writer Groupie Podcast. I'm Kim Smith, the writing guru, bringing you discussions, insights, and insider details on planning, producing, promoting, and profiting as a writer. This is a podcast by writers for writers. You can find out more about Writer Groupie at www.kimsmithauthor.com. And here's the next episode of Writer Groupie. And welcome everybody back to the latest episode of Writer Groupie. I'm here today with my good friend Mary Buckham who has come back on Writer Groupie to share some great interesting stuff. I'm so excited to have her back and for her to tell us about her latest work that's coming out. Mary, take the floor. Thank you, Kim. I really appreciate that. Um, I'm back here to talk because Kim and I always have a great time talking. I'm a writer of fiction but also a writer of nonfiction craft books for writers. Um, so in other words, what I have taught live and online classes for the last dozen years, I'm now putting in book form, um, based on my experience with writers of all different genres, as to what stumbling block do they keep encountering and not finding any resources to help them. Mm, good point. Um, because we have a tendency in the writing world to keep running across the same types of books about the same types of issues and setting was something in my writing active setting series that I found writers stumbled all the time they just struggled with it and I could not say go to this book or go to this resource right. that can help you work through it so when I can't find something I just write it myself <laughs> um, yay I'm so excited about that because your books have really helped me telling you guys if you haven't gone out and gotten Mary's set of books about writing active setting and the hook book and all that stuff you've really got to pay attention here and listen to what she has to say about it because it has changed my life as a writer I'm so thankful that you wrote the setting book because that's always been my weakest point I've been nothing but upfront and honest about that and it, it, it's it's phenomenal how you have the, the little exercises to help you try the things that you show us to do to make our settings active and pertinent to the story. And so thank you for writing that book. Thank you for writing this book because I'm confident that it is going to be just as helpful to me as the first one was. Well, one of the reasons I wrote the book on hooks is that as a writer, we're constantly hear, hearing, you need to hook a reader. You need to engage that reader. You need to hook them. And, but no one ever tells us how to do that. True. So it's like you need to pace your story, but nobody tells you how to pace your story. The little concrete steps that can increase pace or slow pace. And the same with hooks. And like many other topics that writers use and words, we use the same word to mean multiple things. True. In True. the two books on hooks, Writing Active Hooks Book 1 and Writing Active Hooks Book 2, what I've done is I've taken the nine most universal hooks which means they are used across the board regardless of what kind of genre you write in. Um, and they tend to resonate most with people, regardless, with readers. Awesome. Um, as opposed to looking at the esoteric hooks. Then what I did is I analyzed those nine hooks and I broke them down into what you see these types of hooks more often in mysteries or thrillers. Ooh, you use awesome. these kind of hooks um, in women's fiction or literary. Just little hints to get um, to help writers. Then what I did is I gave examples from all different genres so that you could see this is a hook. And this, if you break that hook apart, this is why it's working. Oh my is gosh, it because I it cannot has... wait for this book. Oh my gosh, how fabulous. Mary, you're a genius. That's just <laughs> genius. You're brilliant, as Joanna Penn would say. <laughs> I'm actually, I think I'm lazy. It's like I want to know. It's Writing is a big enough challenge as it is. Mm -hmm. There's so much that we have to keep juggling as the writer to get our stories out. And then you add in something like hooks or being told, to, but, but where do you use them? How many are needed? 
Um, how do you know where to look for them? And there's key locations in stories. And in the back of the writing act of setting the complete how-to guide, I included a kind of a, an introduction to hooks so that you could have a little bit of an idea and just a snippet of it. Um, the good news is, and the bad news is, bad news is that book is going away. Um, that box set is going away as of November because Writer's okay. Digest has come to me and asked me to write that book for them. God bless you, girl. <laughs> I'm so glad because truly it'll reach a wider market and truly it is desperately needed. So I'm glad well, of that. Being re released by Writer's Digest in November and as a result, the hook section of it won't be there anymore. So my goal is to get the hook books out in the hands of readers or writers right now and so that they have some kind of tool that I approach hooks much like I approach setting. And I assumed I used great authors, but then I broke it down to assuming that there was a rough draft. Right. You know, maybe they said this at first, and it might have two hooks, but they're writing the type of a story that needs seven hooks, and here's how they did that. Oh, okay. To that point. So I, I love like those to practical things that you do. You make it so easy to understand and so applicable to what, what someone is writing. Just love it. Well, yeah, it just... And the other thing that I really found helpful was knowing where those hooks have to be. Now... They can be throughout your whole story, and that's important. But there's certain areas in every story where they have to be, because if they are not there, they are not going to engage the reader and keep them turning the page. So I analyzed that first page, why that first sentence is so important, but why you also need something by the end of the first paragraph. Ooh. And that's the I point. I know about that. Yes, that you decide or not decide to buy the book. But then you need to go in about 250 words for the end of the first page. Because if a reader turns the page, including an editor or an agent, they will be engaged enough to keep going. Then you have to go to the third page of a story. Now this third page of a story is specifically for those who are writing to traditional editors and agents. Because that's about where they will put a manuscript down and decide to either read the whole manuscript or have one of their readers read it. Oh. So if you re-engage at that point, and hook is another way to say, raise a question in the reader's mind. Right. That's why we read fiction, to answer questions. Well, um, I knew about a hook at the beginning, and I knew about a hook at the end of a chapter, say, because you want for them to come back for the next chapter. You want for them to just keep turning those pages. But anything else aside from those two places, had no clue. Um, beginning of every scene, if you have multiple scenes within a chapter, because it's a natural place for us as readers to set the book down. Um, end it's of the awesome. chapter, of course, is marvelous, but you also have to re-engage at the beginning of the chapter. True, because true. many readers, it's late, we read at night, yes. we're looking for reasons to set the book down. Right. In many ways, we're like editors and agents. Give them a reason to set the book down, they're not going to buy it. Give a reader a reason to set the book down, and it's like inertia. They have to overcome it to come back unless you've given them a reason, which right. is those hooks on the next chapter that you think, I'm just going to read the next line to find out if it's... But if you've got re-engaged... <laughs> I Every love books hook. like that, Mary. I do. I mean, I'm telling you, some of the, the famous writers of the world who have written those really, really great books that we all talk about, I mean, that's exactly what they do. And me as a reader, and I'm a huge reader, I mean, I mean I'll mean, i go without sleep. If it's good enough, I mean, just keep on exactly. turning those pages. <laughs> and, and that's the whole point. And it doesn't have to be fast-paced. It can be paced appropriately for whatever genre. You don't want women's fiction or literary or cozy mystery to be paced like suspense, romantic suspense, uh, thrillers. There's a balance and there's a need, but all of them require hooks. Right, right, right. The type of hooks can change. And um, understanding what those hooks are, why hooks are very subjective, which right. means there's certain ones that resonate for you and there's certain ones that resonate more for me until we study them as a writer and understand it's not about us anymore. 
That's that first thing, you know, take off your writer hat. It's not about you. Right. It's about the reader. So you're always refocusing in as what does the reader of this type of book, what are their expectations for the speed of the book because hooks impact the pacing. Too many hooks creates it too fast. Too few hooks makes it too slow. So there's, it's a constant balancing act. So I created these two books as a tool to help writers analyze their own work, analyze what works in other people's work and why, and be able to start applying it to their own uh, process. Maybe not in the first draft, but the more you think in terms of hooks, the easier it is to come back and say, oh, I just heard a great hook, you know, someone talking behind me at the grocery store, that type of thing. Wow. And, and start realizing how powerful these little insights can be. And, you know, I think that I would do better with them if I knew what I was doing. So it's exactly. like, what a great opportunity and a great tool for us to just to be able to recognize what a hook is and when we see them. Right, and so that we can step away from the type that come naturally to us. It's kind of like anything else that we do. All right, I know how to ride a bike in a straight line. We don't stop there. We learn how to turn a corner. We learn how to do figure eights. We learn how to, if you're my son, you learn how to, you know, go up and over mountains and all that kind of stuff. But <laughs> You learn how to pop a wheelie. <laughs> <laughs> I did that, but probably not on purpose. Um, but the point is, is to be intentional about it, to take away the mystery and the guesswork as writers as to, well, I'm assuming this is going to interest somebody, right. but not having any idea of how or why that works or doesn't work. Um, there are a few writers out there that intrinsically understand hooks. Um, I hate them all. <laughs> not really. <laughs> but you, the, something to learn from them. Um, why is it that this book I pick up and I read and it's like ho-hum and this book you don't talk to me you don't need to be fed I fed you yesterday <laughs> because you are so engaged and yeah. you are so pulled into that story and grabbed by it and you have to keep going and they can be totally different types of books but they still have that element and that's what I try to achieve in this hook book is to give writers those tools, explanations of them, exercises so they can practice and see, oh, is this the one that's always causing me challenges? Or I didn't even know that was a hook, but it can work. Um, wow, this is exciting. This is so <laughs> exciting, Mary. You just don't know. I'm telling you, I'm not just being flattery here. I, you have changed my life already with one of your books. I'm going to be the best darn writer there ever was when I get through with this series. <laughs> well, and that's, that's my intention, is that that's the best news. Because the more great books out there and strong writers, the more readers appreciate that's it. That's very and, true. And the more readers can trust that the books that are being offered to them, even if they don't have gatekeepers such as publishing houses behind them, a reader doesn't think, oh, this is from, you know, Penguin Putnam, this is from uh, St. Martin's Press. No, they think all books are created equal. That's true. So when they buy one and it falls flat just because the author did not dig enough to understand the elements that makes this a great book and makes this one an okay book and makes that one suck. Um, right. It's the reader that suffers, and that's, that makes them a lot more wary to pick up somebody else's book that they don't know about. Yeah, you're right, and with as many books out there now and as many books as are coming out every day now, we mm -hmm. literally have to find ways to stand above the rest and shine because... You know, readers have an awful lot of choices these days, and if they get disappointed too many times, then we're really going to be in some trouble. So it's anything that we can do to make their reading experience just the best it's ever been, man, I'm all for that. And it also pays off for writers, too, because 
that way you don't have to compete based on price alone to where the point that you're giving all your books away just to get them into the hands of some readers when you can write well and give a solid consistent product book after book after book then a reader will buy you because of the quality of your work not just the price yeah. So yeah. price may get them in the door, but it's going to be the quality of the work once they're in there. And uh, Amazon right. understands this, and that's why they allow readers to read those first couple pages of a book, because they are doing exactly what editors and agents do. You know, if it doesn't really... catch wow. our reader wow. at that point, that opening page, editors and agents we usually send three chapters, 50 pages, 100 pages to them. So they can flip over to the next chapter or the next scene and see if the book really starts there. Um, readers aren't going to do that. They're not oh, going to. True. Yeah. And they're they. standing in a bookstore or they're online at a bookseller and their time is at a premium. I mean, it seems like we're losing them faster and faster. Well, we are because we don't have the time to read. That's true. Um, it's fascinating talking with other writers because one of the first things that writers stop doing is reading um, the minute they start writing because you're juggling it between the daytime job, the family, the pets, the, um, the tornado that's going through, whatever is happening. And so they stop reading, but then that makes it easy for them to stop thinking like a reader. Mm. And... But I, you always put things in a way that I don't, I haven't examined it in that light before. And that is so true. I cannot tell you how many writers I've talked to recently, online, offline, or whatever, who have just pulled back and told me, oh, I just don't read anymore. I don't have time. Mm -hmm. Or, well, I don't read in that genre if I'm writing in that genre because I don't want to inadvertently, you know, plagiarize something, you know, an idea or a, a whatever. Uh, and so... The ones who say, I don't read, for whatever reason, but especially because they don't have time or because, you know, reading has just become a secondary facet of their life that they don't give a lot of time to anymore. That really just shocks me because, and like I always tell people, I am a writer groupie. I love writers. I love books. I love to read a good book and get so engrossed in it that I'll forget where I'm at and then I want to go right out and call that, that writer up and say, I just love your book. Oh, please, please, please come on my show because I want to find out more about who you are as a writer. Well, and that's why I think it's just a win-win. Um, the next book after the writing, writing Hooks book two is currently available for pre-order. But so it should be live here in the next... Mm, six to seven days. Um, the next book's on the writing act of body language because oh, wow. I find, again, it is one of those untapped gold mines for getting emotion on the page, showing the differences in male-female perspective, how a male thinks, acts moves versus a female so when you're writing characters of the opposite sex you have a reference source that basically says I don't have to figure this out by myself anymore I can go and here it is right. and it's quick and it's short so I can my whole focus when I teach is how to let other people apply the concepts to their work as soon as possible right. because as long as it stays in our head we think we can do it. And it's only when we actually put it on the paper that we realize this might be a little bit more challenging. Otherwise, oh, everyone yeah. would do it naturally. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm there. The little exercises you have in the active setting book are, I, I mean, seriously, I wrote a paragraph using the example that you had. Um, and honestly, it was probably some of the best writing I've ever done. Just because what you advised us to try worked for me and and honestly when I was writing it it was hard it was like pulling teeth because I'm thinking you know oh my gosh you know I never thought about this this way and 
talking, getting that little nuance there is so important. Why haven't I ever done this before? It really just sends you off into different tangents. But I'm telling you, Mary, telling everybody listening, this is critical. <laughs> You've got to get these books. These books are phenomenal. Thank you. And, and the reason I feel that they can speak to writers is because I had to learn the lessons myself. You know, I don't try to teach something I can't do. And, but the only way to me is to, I, there were so many when I was first starting out, workshops that I would go to, you know, where you go to listen for an hour, even a whole day workshop, and yeah. you'd go home and you'd get excited, yeah. and then you'd write the whole bloody book and you'd think that you had whatever that concept was. That's the reason there are so many books about plotting, about point of view about um, characterization because we do need those cornerstones yeah. of a good story but once you get beyond that it's the tweak here ratchet up there make a difference that makes a writer stand out yeah. and you have to stand out in a competitive marketplace yes. um, either going through an editor and agent or just getting your book in front of readers they have to feel like okay, this is something that I trust enough that well, however much money I spend on it, it's yes, going to be yes. worth it. Yes, and trust is a huge issue with readers now because there has been an awful lot of dreck out there that readers have spent hard-earned cash for, and they've been so disappointed that now they're like, okay, I don't think I even want to try this author again because I read one of their books and their book was horrible and they don't trust us anymore. Well, but from the author's point of view, they're not thinking they're putting out direct. They think that they're putting out the best product that they can. Right. And they are at that time. But it's that mistake that is made is putting something out before it really has been vetted. And that was the whole purpose of editor and agent. It was not to keep, you know, the brilliant people away from getting published. It was to give a, a process that, all right, those who really do want to be published have to go back and back and back, learn more, try harder, ramp it up, understand this, look at that before they ever got it out into the hands of a reader and now that's not happening that's so true. I'm seeing people that are have written a book and it may have taken 10 years to write the book but the book is not ready the plot is not solid the characterization is more about caricature um, motivation is weak there is no setting um, there is no body language, there are no hooks. None of those issues have been addressed because the author has been so excited about Consumed, <laughs> consumed. They have been consumed with a story that's been rattling around in their head and their heart for so many years. They can't wait to get it on the page. And it's like once it's on the page, they're so excited about that story finally coming to existence that they're just ready for somebody else to see it. And they don't, and I'm, oh Lord, I am so saying this about myself. I'm as guilty as anybody else in this entire world as a writer who has done this. You just get so excited about your story being on, in a form that somebody else can actually see it. You just want somebody else to have it in their hot little hands and to read it. You don't really think about the fact that when they read it, their opinion of it is going to be a little bit different color from yours because yours is as a parent to a child and theirs is from, you know, the uh, guidance counselor at school to the child. <laughs> well, it's like we would not take our child who is ready for kindergarten and send them off to brain surgery school. Right. You know, we know there might be a few more steps involved. We exactly. We think that there might be... And it's wonderful when you belong to a group or uh, an organization that helps you see that need, but it is up to every single writer individually to challenge themselves, uh, to get enough feedback from people if it's no longer an editor or an agent, but somebody who will have higher expectations and act as the cold reader 
you can't talk it right. So if you are working with with, um, writers and they bring something to your attention and you have to explain something to them, you don't get that with a reader. So... And I've Readers. heard that from some critique partners before. When they've gone through some of my work, they're like, okay, I didn't understand this. And I'll be like, well, she meant so-and-so and such-and-such. And they'd be like, Kim, that's not on the page. And I'm <laughs> like, well, well, well. And they're like, you can't, like, pop into somebody's head over their shoulder and say, now, by the way, in this section, so-and-so and such-and-such is, you know, in their head. It just doesn't work that way. You can't pop into a reader's head and explain to them what's going on. It has to be on the page. Well, you would think after being married a long time, most of us would realize this. It just doesn't work like that. No matter how much we want it to happen that way. Amen. Amen. I'm with you on that one. <laughs> Too funny. Well, so tell us the, the journey from here. What do we do? How do we get the book? Um, when can we expect it? Um, if you got a promotional period, we're going to get it for a special price. What else? What is the news here? Well, the news is is that it is in an e-format version. It is currently available at every place that will do pre-orders, which is everybody except Nook. So Amazon, um, iTunes, uh, all, all those other e-versions. Um, down the road sometime when I come up for air, the year 20,027, um, <laughs> I'm hoping to pull it together into a print book because I do know that writers love a print book to put the little, you know, highlights in and dog ear the pages. So yes. that will be coming. But I do want to get the three books on body language next. Um, I'd like to get them out this year. And they will be under the writing active, so same type of word, um, writing active body language, just to understand our bodies. What does your head say? What do your hands say? What does your shoulders say? Who knew your torso did a lot of talking and how it moved? Um, who knew the knees have a language and a message? And as humans, we read body language all the time. We just forget how to translate it onto the page. Oh, man, so then I will have one on body language and emotion. So how to use those basic body parts and then combine it with the underlying emotion to create subtext and conflict and emotion on the page. Um, And then the third one will be the body language um, differences between men and women. Um, Because that's a wealth of material um, that is really fun to explore and we don't even realize why it's happening. Um, So we're constantly writing as if our personal experience means this. So that must be the universal experience without having mm-hmm. any understanding of the why behind it. Exactly. Um, so those three books I hope to have out this year. And awesome. I will have the new Writing Active setting through Writer's Digest. That will be coming out in November. That's up for pre-order now. Um, and then I'll have two or three fiction books out again this year. Um, just re-released Break Into Fiction that I co-author with um, New York Times' Diana Love. And that came out, what month are we in, April? Yes, this is April. Okay. So, so far this year I've had four books out, or four books written. So, three nonfiction, one fiction. My goodness, um, no wonder you said if you come up for air in somewhere around 2027, <laughs> because my word, you are just so busy totally prolific and and they're wonderful they're really wonderful I, you are my idol you really oh. truly are my idol but I want to be you know as, as prolific and as popular and as you know just you're just wonderful Mary I just love you to death I'm so thankful to have you come back on writer group a second time and you know I want you to come back when those <laughs> body language books come out I definitely want you to come back so we got to well, plan I, this when I what I've done is that because I'm still going at this year, I'm going around the country and giving uh, workshops, plotting workshops, where I have up to 10 people and I sit down with them one on one and we plot through their book or series of books or, um, and then teach people how to plot a commercial fiction book, not literary fiction, but commercial fiction because it's a different structure. So I'm constantly still hearing the same type of 
what issues are creating speed bumps for writers? Wow. You know, mm -hmm. what's keeping them from taking their book to the next level? And that's what I look at when I look at the next writing craft book that I'm going to be doing. Um, I'm hoping that by having the set of on hooks, on body language, and on setting, because I'll get to keep the little this. Yes. 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 Yay, the individual book. book I will get to keep on my own. So I can play around with those when um, Writer's Digest does the bigger book. But I think that will open up the world of setting for um, writers. And I am plan to do the same thing. My goal is to make everybody an official hooker. Um, <laughs> I am so using that. <laughs> uh, that's actually one of the things that I give out to my the beta readers who read this book is, is they get a uh, uh, coffee, you know, where you set drinks on it, the little coffee, what do you call coasters, those things? Coasters. Yeah. Yes. So it's an official hooker coaster. Um, I love and it. I give out to anybody who does write a review and lets me know about it is I send them a, a little magnet. This is the magnet for the book itself. This is the new book coming out. Love and then I, no, that says book, yeah, that is book two. So book one has an orange cover. Book two has a green cover. And I send them this, and then I send them a little um, magnet that has a fictional hooker. So. <laughs> okay, so, you know, it's on pre-order, so everybody, you know, you need to go out there and you need to plan on getting this book from Mary because it is so so critical for a writer to have these great informative books and I want mine I'm going out and getting mine today <laughs> I'm definitely going to do that that is my principal plan for this afternoon <laughs> I, I can almost see your husband in the corner smiling oh my wife's turning into a hooker <laughs> <laughs> actually yeah he is <laughs> win-win it is it definitely is so you know is there going to be some plotting workshops this summer where are you going to be where people can find those um you can find information about them on my website www.marymarybuckham like a deer and a pig <laughs> b-u-c-k-h-a-m.com um this year i have given one in phoenix and one in portland oregon I will be offering one in May in Ohio, in Columbus, Ohio, in August in Denver, Colorado, in September in Connecticut, Hartford, Connecticut, and also in September in upstate New York in Canandaigua, which is one near the Finger Lakes. Um, so there are, between the next four events, I think there's five openings between them that are still open. The rest of them are, are booked. You only take um, a certain number of people for those plotting workshops, right? Yes, ten people, because it's, one, most people are not used to thinking about their story so intensely over a two-day time period, so it's a brain drain for everyone. But two, it's, I build in time to sit down with every single person to talk about their specific book and what may be causing them issues. Right. Um, that way it, I can help identify are you just having the one damn thing after another syndrome right. happening in your story? Um, are your, is your character reacting or are they acting? Are they motivated to act and how do you show that? Um, we go through the Break Into Fiction book has a series of 11 templates to literally answer questions about your story. So we review those templates, we work on everybody's story individually and as a group, not as a group think. So it's not, you're not sharing your story with everybody else, but talking about every single one of those templates and explaining how they work and why they're needed in a story, what the intention is. And those templates are really great because they can be used as a revision tool as well as initial plotting. So the goal isn't to change pansters to plotters or tell plotters how to do it, like there's only one way. It is to identify 
This is the roadmap. This is what you need to get from here to there. Use it any way that works for you. You know, if you want to write everything and then go back and realize, oops, I'm missing this and this and this and go back and re-strengthen those parts of your stories, and then that works really good. So um, I'll be doing those. I'm doing those this year. I don't know how long I can do the live ones, um, simply because it's extremely intense for me. There's lots of travel involved. Yeah. And with my publishing schedule and the books I have to write, right. it does make it a little more challenging. I bet it does. Bless your heart, because I know I'm doing some live events myself this year. This is my year to to break the ice as a public speaker kind of thing. And I've been on panels at a con, which was extremely fun. I have been a speaker at an author event at, at a local college library. I'm going to do a local, uh, well, regional more or less, uh, book signing. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I'm, I've spoken to you. I'm going to the RAGT in uh, uh, Ohio, uh, which will be a book signing and an event more, I'm taking it as more of an event for myself because I'll get to see a lot of writer friends. Um, also, and I'm going to be at Imaginarium in Louisville, Kentucky in the fall. And so these are things that I've never done before. This is a new experience for me. I have a healthy respect for uh, authors who are out there just, you know, hitting the pavement and trying to write books. It's difficult. Um, it is, but on the other hand, it keeps you engaged with the larger world. It gets you out of your four walls and your perspective because moving outside of that lets you see, oh, you know, I thought this was the newest thing since sliced bread and everybody else is saying, no, I'm sorry, that's old fashioned, it's already gone. Right. But I'm, I'm still catching up. Um, that's how so, I was with QR codes. I didn't know anything about QR codes, and I learned about those, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is the greatest thing I've ever heard of. And everybody's like, you just not hearing about that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they've done that, already gone. Yeah. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that five seconds was over. Uh, yeah, so I think um, to be in the world of publishing, which is different than being a writer, but being in the world of publishing, you need to have access to readers, and the opportunity to connect on as many different levels as possible. So a uh, Facebook, a Twitter, podcast, blogs, um, but also live. There's nothing like yes. meeting the reader, the author of something that you enjoy live and yes. finding out um, you, you, that you like them, that they're real, that they're human. Yes. But they, you know, make mistakes and blow off podcast meetings and all sorts of things. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you beat yourself up about that. This has been a wonderful afternoon. I have enjoyed spending it with you, listening to you, and not hearing you. <laughs> and, and Mary, I, I'm, I'm going to get ready to close our show because I know I mean, you're a busy woman and you've got things to do today, too. But it's been so much fun. Please tell me you'll come back. Absolutely. I just enjoy it and... I look forward to getting word out to others about this and sharing what you're doing with so many people because it's such a win-win for everybody. Well, thank, so thank you. you. Thank you for being my guest and thank you for being my hero because I'm telling you, these books are changing my life as a writer and I'm excited for them and I'm excited for you because you're, you're going to put the world on fire in writing circles. I just feel it. Well, once I figure out this technology thing, maybe world domination is easier. <laughs> yeah, a microphone to work. <laughs> well, thanks so much for being with me this afternoon, Mary. Hang on just a minute. I'm going to close our show. Thank you for listening to this edition of Writer Groupies. For booking information, show notes, and more, visit KimSmithAuthor.com.